We've got a student loan epidemic. It's a big deal. Is college still worth it? More than 40% of borrowers aren't making payments. So what's a student to do? There are only two people willing to give a 17-year-old a $100,000 loan. One is a loan shark, and the other, well, she kind of works for the government. Her name is Sally Mae. Now think about it, a 17-year-old kid is barely getting their life started. They may have a part-time job, no assets, no credit history. Would you really give a 17-year-old kid $100,000? Would you? You're probably saying, there's no way in the world I would. Well, maybe if it was guaranteed that you're going to get your money back, which, by the way, that's essentially what the government does. And here's what I mean by it. It got started under Carter. Then it became tough during Reagan. And it pretty much became impossible during George W. Bush. But one of the topics recently by Bernie Sanders was college is way too expensive for kids. We should have free tuition at public colleges and universities. That should be a right of all Americans, regardless of the income of their families. Which I do agree with Bernie Sanders. However, there's one big question, and here's what it is. How do we fix it? So he proposed taxpayers pay for it, which do you really want to pay more taxes? Do you? You really want to pay for everybody's college education? See, my proposal is slightly different. Rather than having taxpayers pay for it, why don't we investigate and find out why does college cost so much in the first place? We did a little digging just to see where all this money is going to and what's really taking place, and you're going to be absolutely shell-shocked by the numbers. First of all, you pay taxes. I pay taxes. Businesses pay taxes. We may not like it, but we pay taxes. Who doesn't pay taxes? Well, you know who doesn't pay taxes? Colleges and universities. According to the IRS, the vast majority of private and public universities and colleges are tax-exempt entities as defined by Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3. Okay, no big deal. I get it. It's about education. Maybe this makes sense. We shouldn't be taxing them. So this means, obviously, their football ticket sales get taxed, right? Or on-campus concerts that have nothing to do with education. They also get taxed, right? Again from the IRS. Income and activities that are substantially related to the purpose of an institution's tax exemption, charitable contributions received, and investment income. Let me say it again. Investment income are not subject to federal income taxes. Are you kidding me? Can I sign up and start this business called a college or a university? But Pat, come on now. That's got to be only state schools because there's no way in the world that has to go same as private schools, right? Because private is like private enterprise, private businesses. They get taxed, right? right? Like these Ivy League schools, they should be paying taxes, yes? Well, private schools get the same privileges as public schools under our current tax code. So not only do they not pay taxes on the land, on the tuition, or the sponsorships, or the donations, or the 12% they're raking in annually in capital gains from that bounty. <laughs> That's a lot of money. But those schools actually have the guts to get money from taxpayers on top of all of that. We're not talking a little bit of money. So billions in, zero out. Rutgers University has 70,000 students enrolled at an average of $26,000 a year. That covers room, board, parking, meal plans, and approximately $2,000 a year in books, which is a scam within a scam. So let's do some math here. Let's take this $26,000 of tuition, multiply times 70,000 students, it equals $1.8 billion on the low end. That's Fortune 500 gross annual revenue type of numbers we're talking about here. However, according to its own website, approximately 26% of Rutgers revenue comes from tuition with an additional 22% coming from state subsidies, also known as taxes. You know who pays for it? You pay for it. Having estimated the tuition revenue at $1.8 billion, we can assume that additional revenue they're getting is going to be around $1.5 billion from the citizens of the state of New Jersey. That's nearly $3.5 billion per year, ready, tax-free on top of that, tax-subsidized. By the way, $3.5 billion, the valuation of massive corporations like Yelp and Credit Karma, and as an annual revenue outpaces, ready for this one, the legendary Elon Musk's Tesla. Rutgers University is competing against Tesla every year, tax-free. 
You tell me if you don't smell a scam here. Let's take a look at what they do with this windfall of cash that they get. They must really give back to community, right? You ready? They hoard it. They organize nonstop donation drives and build these amorphous hedge funds called endowments. It's never enough. Let me give you a stat here. Harvard, a very reputable school, has an endowment of over $36 billion, which, fun fact, according to the IMF, would put Harvard between Bolivia and Bahrain as a 96th largest economy in the world. And based on data from the United Nations, there are over 100 countries with smaller economies than the Harvard endowment alone. Listen, without even accounting for compound interest, their tax-free mountain of cash, just off that endowment alone, Harvard could afford to pay their $50,000 a year tuition for their 6,000 students. You know for how long? Not 10 years, not 30 years, not 50 years, 120 years for free and not asking for another penny. Meanwhile, student debt continues to pile up and has nearly doubled over the past decade. Ready? To $1.3 trillion. If you took all our credit card debt, every single one of the credit cards we have in our pocket, you took all of it and combine it together, it's only $977 billion versus $1.3 trillion. One third of all student loan debt exceeds $100,000 and borrowers now leave school owing on average about $34,000. That's up 70% just the last decade. You may say, well, Pat, I don't go to college. I don't have any debt. I don't care about any of this kind of stuff. How does this affect me? Listen, we are seeing now the student loan debt has had an adverse effect on other major parts of the economy. Between the high monthly payments and the mounting rate of default on student loans destroying young people's credit ratings, it's so much harder for them to buy cars, to buy a house, to move on simply because of the payments they need to be making. But the puppet masters know all of this. They're aware. They know exactly what's taking place. They know this is unsustainable. They know they are charging an arm and a leg and dragging out the process of four, five, ten years while all of this can be done in 18 months with a laptop and internet connection. Look, you don't have to agree with everything in this video, but consider this for a second here. 20 years ago, if I came to your place, you probably had photo albums everywhere, right? And I'd come and say, here's my kid, here's my mom, here's my family, all this. Oh, wow, this is so beautiful. When's the last time you had a photo album? We use Instagram today. Everything due to technology has become faster and more efficient, yet college takes longer and costs more. Why is that? Two reasons. Very simple. Greed and politics. College campuses have become havens for political favors and handouts. Look, let's take for example University of Virginia. It's the third ranked public university in America. Did you know this university has 19 members of the board who make the decisions for the school? 17 were appointed by the governor? 17 out of 19? So you may ask, well Pat, how many is faculty and students? Students get one member, <laughs> faculty gets one member. Two out of 19 they get. That's a monopoly in real life if you do it in business but not when you do it in universities. Out of the 17 you appointed, five of them don't live in the state of Virginia. The 12 who do, 10 of them contributed to his political party. I want to go a little deeper because some people may ask, well, what, what else would be the motive? Who cares if I sit on a board? I mean, is there really money to be made? They don't get paid a salary, right? Can you imagine the amount of business that's on a college campus? Think about the bigger picture here. Who do you think gets the construction contract to build that new quarter of a billion dollar football stadium. Who do you think gets that? Whose cousin do you think happens to get the big Starbucks contract franchise approved to be on campus? Or whose brother-in-law is charging prevailing wage to haul the massive amounts of garbage off campus five days a week? Look, I want to make one thing very clear. I'm not anti-education. I'm not anti-learning. I run a business for a living. I read books on a daily basis. I have a wife. I have kids. I have a family. I'm all for education. I was positively influenced by school teachers. I can tell you many educators that changed my life. I joined the Army because of a health and guidance teacher called Miss Sinclair that completely changed my life. We're friends till today. We write letters to each other. I don't have a problem with the educators. I don't have a problem with the educated. I have a problem with the educational system. And the educational system, when I sit down and uncover everything that they're doing, and I see the greed, and I see the politics, and I see the games being played, and I don't see innovation, while the world today is the most innovating times we've ever lived in, everything is getting better so much faster. But our educational system is not. And I'm not trying to tell you I have all the answers. Of course I don't have all the answers. 
I am simply proposing this to you for us to start thinking about it and auditing this and saying, listen, what can we do better? So I'm asking you, what are your thoughts about today's video? How would you see us being able to make the system better? I want to hear from you. Either comment below or tweet me directly at Patrick Bed David. I want to hear your thoughts.